Today was an event that culminated a year-long pilot project to implement complete streets in Baton Rouge. It is a community issue because if you make streets safe for the older members of the family, then you've made them safe for everybody. Happy to see all of you here bright and early this morning. Um, those of you who were here yesterday, I hope uh, enjoyed the day as much as I did. I thought it was some fantastic programs, and uh, I'm sure we have more of the same to look forward to this morning. Um, so uh, as you have noticed in your program, we're starting this morning with uh, two separate um, programs for you to choose from. In this venue will be the first part of our Making Cities Smarter track. Uh, and uh, in and in the other Hartley Vey space will be the um, program on due diligence in real estate transactions. So, um, uh, in a moment, I'll ask anyone who's planning to go to the other program to uh, go ahead and proceed over there. Um, I do want to uh, give special recognition once again to our sponsors. Uh, we will be displaying their names uh, from time to time through the day. And uh, please realize that without their financial support, this event, which has become, I think, a very important part of the planning efforts across Louisiana, uh, would not be possible. Furthermore, without the support of the members of CPEX, CPEX would not be possible. So. I would again encourage anyone who may not be a member of CPEX to please consider uh, supporting the organization. Um, we, we rely upon the support of our members for our very existence. We're not a governmental organization and we are strictly a, a volunteer nonprofit. So um, thank you for your interest in these important topics. And at this time, I'll invite anyone who may be going to the uh, other program to Go ahead and head that way, and uh, Boo Thomas, the CEO of CPEX, will come up to introduce this program. Thank you. Good morning. It's going to be a, um, another very exciting day. And uh, before I introduce uh, John Snow to you uh, and kick off this exciting morning, I wanted to explain something to you all, because you know, CPEX is all about diversity, and we certainly like to promote, you know, uh, a real mix of our speakers. You might notice today that in this morning, we are absent of women entrepreneurs. So I'm going to make up something that I do. Well, not really. It's not because we didn't invite them. So I want to give you some of the names of the women entrepreneurs that we did attempt to get here. We tried Rachel Hote, the managing director of 1776, a startup incubator lo located in New York City. Jean Palka, the founder of Code for America. Cecilia Munoz, the VP for Policy and Technology for New America. Janet Sadak Khan, New York City, one of the world's most foremost authorities on transportation and urban transformation. And Deborah Lamb, former Pittsburgh Chief of Innov Innovation. We'll continue to pursue them. We just had a lot of effort and just were not successful for this year. But I'll tell you, what, if this morning is really successful, it will be because of John Snow and Curtis Harriman and a, some assistance from Stephen Loy of our tech park. And they really know these people on a first name basis and uh, were able to recruit the wonderful speakers that we have this morning. So John Snow, some of you need no introduction, but he's vice president and partner at Emergent Method a Louisiana-based management and strategy consulting firm. They're our sponsor for this, uh, all of these morning ses sessions, Emergent Methods. John Snow and Curtis, as I told you, did a yeoman's task of shaping and recruiting the speakers for these sessions and helped us put together this new format for you. John's expertise is rooted in strategic and organizational planning, community and stakeholder outreach, and strategic communications. He's worked on many large-scale planning efforts for clients over the past years, including the city of Baton Rouge, Parish of East Baton Rouge, the Baton Rouge Metropolitan Airport, the Las Vegas Globally Not Economic Alliance, LED, Calcasieu Parish, Police Jury, and many more. And it often occurs at the convergence of technology, 
di digital strategy, infrastructure, public policy, and strategic communications. Best of all about John is he is so creative and willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So please welcome with me John Snow. Thank you, Boo. Good morning. Um, quick show of hands. Has anyone heard the term smart city before? I see a couple of hands not raised. This is the smart cities track of the Smart Growth Summit, so uh, you're in for an exciting day um, if you're unaware with, of the term. Um, how many of you know what it means, roughly speaking? I'm not going to quiz you on it. That's great. Um, the reality is none of you are wrong in your own definitions or what you believe to be the definition of a smart city. Um, if you go on Google and search for smart city, you're going to get 77.7 million results back. Um, with a lot of varying definitions as to what a smart city is, what it could be, cities' interpretations of smart cities, various initiatives that cities are pursuing. Um, I want to read to you the first definition that comes back from the uh, authoritative and irrefutable source known as Wikipedia. Um, it says, a smart city is an urban area that uses different types of electronic data collection sensors to supply information used to manage assets and resources efficiently. That's a mouthful. Um, the reality is there's 77 million other definitions quite like that, maybe not as technical, hopefully not as technical, that are all saying similar things. Defining what it means to be a smart city is something that uh, a lot of cities struggle with. Um, the act of, of, of assigning a definition or a label uh, to what they're trying to become or what they maybe already are. Um, the ironic part is that a city's definition of being a smart city, it comes from how they are a smart city, not that they are a smart city. It's all in the actions they take to get there. Over the past four years, uh, my team and I at Emergent Method have spent uh, significant time studying and looking at other municipalities, jurisdictions, states across the U.S. and internationally about what leading cities are doing in the smart city uh, planning space. And we've been fortunate and honored to uh, I've had an opportunity to work um, here in Baton Rouge with our city parish to advance the city parish's own smart city planning efforts. I remember sitting in a uh, large conference room about a year and a half ago um, when a, a number of community stakeholders got together uh, after hearing some exciting news that the federal government um, had let municipalities across the country know. Federal government had 40 plus million dollars. They were looking to invest in one mid-sized city. Um, and they were looking for a city that could put forth a vision that could, that could convince the federal government to deposit these funds into that local environment and fund a series of projects that could advance this idea of a smart city model forward so that other mid-sized cities around the country could emulate, specifically as it relates to transportation. We know that we've got a transportation challenge here, so we hit on one of those criteria. Um, but secondly, we felt like we had a lot to offer as a community um, and some interesting things that we could potentially leverage um, as part of that application process. We had a number of folks that got together in that room uh, that day, um, startup folks, entrepreneurs, coders and developers, economic development organizations, not-for-profits, CPEX, um, representatives from Google, Uber, IBM, elected officials all got together and said, okay, what ideas could we come up with? What technologies are we working on? What policies should we be considering that could feed into this kind of approach or vision for a smart city? Um, and in the coming weeks, we crafted and developed a proposal uh, that ultimately was submitted back to the federal government uh, with what we believe to be an aggressive but achievable uh, path forward um, and one that would be highly competitive for uh, going out uh, and, and working with the government as a part of this smart city challenge. Uh, we were really excited about our application. Um, we, we felt like we had a really competitive application. Uh, it turns out 78 other cities did too. Um, it was a very competitive process. Uh, I do want to compliment um, and congratulate the city of Columbus, Ohio, which ultimately won the Smart City Challenge. They had a tremendous amount of capital uh, leveraged toward uh, the grant that would ultimately come from the United States Department of Transportation, um, and they're already doing some really exciting things there um, and projects and initiatives that, that we ourselves here in Baton Rouge and elsewhere can learn from. Um, you know, soon after that challenge concluded, a few months went by, and the mayor's office and the Metro Council um, collaborated to develop and stand up what's known as the Smart City Committee. 
Um, this committee was really designed, and not to put um, words into the mouths of those who authored the resolution uh, developing this committee, but essentially to sustain the momentum that was created through that, that collaboration to develop uh, the application that was submitted to the federal government. And even in the months prior to that, the city parish had really been making a lot of headway um, in the space when it comes to technology and innovation. It just didn't really have that smart city label behind it uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, and it was actually through that committee and those ongoing uh, conversations and dialogues that uh, the, the uh, discussion that, that Boo mentioned in terms of leveraging that smart city focus toward the summit emerged. Um, I've been honored to have been appointed to that committee and currently serve as chair. Um, and, and we've seen some really exciting initiatives that have come forth um, as a result of the city parish's focus on this idea of smart city planning, so much so that late last year, Baton Rouge was named uh, the fifth most digital city in the United States for mid-sized cities, which is an incredible accomplishment um, and, and one that the team of the city parish is, is very well deserving of. Um, so I guess the question that I get a lot of times is, you know, what makes a smarter city? And in the case of Baton Rouge, what makes Baton Rouge a smarter city? If we're using that as an example, well, there's a few criteria that, that feed into that. Data is one of the most, in fact, in fact if not the most important uh, components of building a smarter city. Um, data, not just in how it, how it exists, but how it's utilized, um, how you're taking data out of silos to, uh, to actually be able to do something meaningful with it across departments, how you're able to put data out into a public environment where residents and businesses and neighborhood groups and civic associations can interact with public sector data in a way that they've never done so before. Um, data means everything in the walls of government and it means everything um, within the context of a community and government as the keeper of that data, government agencies have a tremendous opportunity to push that kind of data out into the public domain so that all who could utilize it can benefit from it. It also takes a focus and an emphasis on innovation and technology. Um, I'll give you an example. Earlier this year, uh, Mayor Broom announced the launch of the Open Neighborhood BR uh, platform, uh, which was the first of its kind in the United States. It essentially pulled in data uh, inputs from our 311 system at the city parish, police data, traffic data, permitting data, all sorts of data, dropped it into a map environment but on the front end, any resident, any user can go in, enter their address, click a button, and instantly see everything that's taking place with respect to city services around their house, their subdivision, their neighborhood, or their part of town. It provides folks with, with an unprecedented ability to understand what exactly is going on around them. Are there trends in crime that I need to be aware of? Is there permitting activity that's really gonna drive me crazy for the next six months? Um, is there a lot of traffic incidents? Are people not getting their garbage picked up? If so, is it happening on my street or just to me? Uh, and if so, what did I do to make the garbage man mad at me? Um, it, it gives you a lot of information in a way that's easily digestible to the end user being the citizen. Um, and it's a very powerful platform that Baton Rouge, again, was the first in the, in the country to adopt. So it takes kind of that willingness to take some risks with respect to technology, spotting trends in ways that technology uh, can, can provide a mechanism and a vehicle for serving the end user. A focus on citizen engagement and not just traditional two-way communication with residents, um, which you know those capabilities have been enhanced in recent years with the advent of technology, social media, to be able to communicate in real time more ably with citizens, which is a really big part of it. The other part is how can you build and forge partnerships with organizations with like-minded missions where you can, and maybe it's even in the private sector, but what the city or a local government or a regional group, state government, whatever it may be, um, what you're doing in terms of your mission to provide exemplary and efficient services to residents may dovetail very nicely with an external partner. And there's some that you'll hear from today that have forged very strong partnerships with local and state government and their communities are reaping the results of that as a result. The, the final component of you know, what, what makes a city smarter, in my opinion, is leadership. And it's leadership that not only understands the importance of, of data and technology and what, what adopting kind of this smart city mindset can do to impact an internal environment within the walls of a city hall or government agency, but it comes down to the indirect impacts as well associated with smart city growth um, and establishing a presence and a brand of being a smarter city. It's the indirect impacts around economic development, quality of life, quality of place, infrastructure, 
all those things funnel up into it, and leadership plays a critical role in that in taking what's going on in the walls of City Hall and making sure that it's connected out to the residents and, and the community that City Hall supports. We saw that in former Mayor Holden, who was a big advocate for smart city planning, and we see that now with Mayor Broom and, and the Metro Council as well throughout the entire process has been very supportive of that growth trajectory in terms of the initiatives that the city parish is trying to take on to, to build a smarter city incrementally working toward that, that larger, broader vision. So in my opinion, you know, what makes a city smarter it's about a city doing things smartly, and it sounds very basic, but it's identifying challenges within government and ways that you can leverage innovation and opportunities to build tech, uh, implement technology, adopt tools that make your job as government easier, more efficient, and delivers maximum impact to the end user being, being the citizen. Um, and a lot of what we've seen in communities around the country, uh, it's not just the high density, high population cities that are making advancements in this smart city space. Smaller cities, really small cities, um, have done some pretty incredible things given the resources available to them. And they're the cities that recognize the tech and tools at their disposal to say, you know what, this is something I can take on. It's a challenge that we can try and solve using the tools that we have, and they've done so in a pretty incredible way. And really that's what today is about. As Boo mentioned, we've got an awesome lineup um, for the entirety of the day of folks who are working in the public sector and the private sector who are innovating and building tremendous approaches and tools and technologies that are uh, helping government and communities uh, become smarter as a result. Um, and it's along those lines I'd really like to, um, I'm, I'm honored to introduce our first panel this morning of the Tech and Tools Making Cities Smarter session. Um, you're going to hear about Open Counter, which builds user-friendly interfaces to address complex regulatory procedures. Um, how partnerships are being built by connecting business and industry to LSU's research expertise, and the Water Institute of the Gulf, uh, located here in Baton Rouge, but serving areas across Louisiana and the world, about their forecasting and modeling tools to help address resiliency and, and, and flooding issues around the world. Um, I'd like to introduce our first uh, speaker and panelist, Joel Mahoney. Joel is the co-founder and CEO of OpenCounter. He was an inaugural fellow at Code for America, which some of you may have heard of, uh, serving as a technical advisor to the organization. Prior to Code for America, Joel founded companies in the health and hospitality sectors. His work has been featured in the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, and the New York Times. He won the International Design for Experience Award for his work with the city of Boston, and in 2012 was named one of GovTech Magazine's top 25 doers, dreamers, and drivers. Please join me in welcoming Joel Mahoney. Good morning, everyone. Good to be here today. Um, so I'm Joel. I'm the co-founder and CEO of OpenCounter. Uh, as John said, OpenCounter started at Code for America, which was a great experience, you know, after the financial crisis, um, you know, trying to help cities be smarter, you know, use technology to solve, uh, you know, common problems that, and challenges that they're, they're facing. So I started this company with my co-founder with a, a strong thesis about economic development. Uh, we've all been hearing about the Amazon HQ2 project. I think they've received 283 proposals for that uh, relocation project or location of their second headquarters. Um, you know, there's a reason that cities spend a lot of time on these kinds of big projects. The numbers are big. Um, these are the numbers for their HQ1 uh, impact in Seattle. Um, and so, of course, you know, every city is, would love to have something like that, you know, move into the, into the community. Um, so it makes sense that we, you know, in economic development, we're spending a lot of time on, on those kinds of efforts. Uh, there's a price, though, for, to get a project like that. And, you know, we, we heard about it in Nevada with the Tesla uh, Gigafactory. You know, this, this was an unprecedented tax break. So there's a cost to, you know, getting, getting the revenue numbers and, and tax numbers coming in. So, so our thesis at OpenCounter is that, you know, there's this other form of economic development, which is often underappreciated, uh, but very significant, which is small business growth and statistically, this really is where the majority of new jobs are coming from in the country. Um, and so we really put ourselves into the shoes of 
uh, small business, you know, prospective small business owners. And my co-founder was working in economic development in the city of Santa Cruz, and his job was kind of a concierge to guide people through this process and take them to the plan encounter and public works and really help them navigate what can often be, you know, a very, very complicated process. So this is Zach and Kendra. They, they founded this company, Penny Ice Creamery, in Santa Cruz. Uh, they now have 65 employees in four locations. So this is, these, this is like the model of, you know, what every city would love to have. There are, you know, parents in the community, uh, very, very connected and, and creating jobs. It took them 21 permits to get, you know, an ice cream parlor open. And every one of these permits is there for a reason, and we, you know, we certainly understand that, but it, it adds complexity and adds friction to this process. And we feel like it's, it's kind of, um, y you know, the Starbucks and Walmarts, they have dedicated site selection people who know how to navigate this process. So it's kind of an unfair uh, burden, we feel, on the small businesses who, who really don't have experience navigating this kind of process. Um, you know, and the friction, it's, it, we can miss these things if we're working, you know, if you're working in government, um, but in California, after the, the financial uh, recession, you know, they had to uh, cut back on services. So imagine walking in and, you know, realizing that the planning department is only open until 11.30 a.m. and uh, closed on Fridays, right? That's, that's adding friction if you're trying to get something done. Um, carbon copy forms, you know, the forms are all different in every department, uh, you know, zoning maps that get very, very complicated, plan developments. Um, we once saw a plan development, I think it was in Asheville. Uh, it, was a, it was called the Burger King plan development, <laughs> which we thought was pretty funny. Um, you know, and this is a, this is a process map uh, from Las Vegas of their, their uh, permitting process. So this is very complicated. Uh, and again, we feel like this is, it's, it's undue complexity for people who are just, they're trying to get something done that everyone wants them to do, which is open a business in the community. Um, so our, our company is trying to streamline permitting and licensing to help citizens navigate this process. I'm focusing on business, uh, um, you know, business permitting today. We also are building tools for residents and, and special events. Uh, so our tool, you could say, is kind of like a TurboTax experience. You're, you know, entering information. You can see here, I've entered restaurant. I probably wouldn't know that the, the land use code for a restaurant is eating and drinking establishment. So, you know, we're using technology to try to be, you know, to, 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 to streamline this process and help people kind of approach it with their normal, intuitive, natural language and actually speak to the city and, and kind of be that middle layer that's translating uh, the regulatory language. Um, we've done a lot of work on the mapping stack. So every city will have zoning maps, but I want to see the zoning map for my particular land use code, right? Like what is the zoning for a yoga studio or a restaurant? Um, and then furthermore, what's the zoning for a restaurant if I'm having takeout or drive-in or serving alcohol. All of those will change the, the zoning footprint and often those restrictions are literally footnotes somewhere in the zoning code. So very, very difficult to understand the impact of, of this information on, on your project. Um, you know, we're basically, you know, building a list of requirements as you're entering information and finally calculating all of the fees in real time, you know, as you're typing your square footage and number of employees and construction costs, we're, we're coming up with a, a scope of that project. Um, so we're four years into this company. Uh, we're working with 50 cities across the country, Boston, Orlando, Charlotte, um, a bunch of cities in California where we're based. And yeah, really excited. We just launched this new product about uh, three months ago, so very excited to, you know, start getting that placed in, in different cities and, and uh, see the reaction. So excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Um, I'm going to introduce our next speaker and panelist, um, Greg Trahan. Greg is the director 
of uh, Economic Development and works at the Office of Research and Economic Development for Louisiana State University, uh, or LSU. Greg represents LSU through that office, or as it's commonly known, ORED, um, and is responsible for translating research, connecting faculty, and aligning assets to build strategic partnerships with business and industry. He also serves as program manager for LSU's Transformational Technology and Cyber Research Center. Have I given you all enough acronyms in this? Uh, the university's applied research division responsible for translating basic research into services, products, and capabilities for the federal government, defense, and intelligence communities. As program manager, Greg assists with business and product development, strategic outreach, and research alignment. Please join me in welcoming Greg Trahan. Good morning. Thank you. Sorry, I'm going to apologize first for my voice, although um, it's apropos. It's like traffic. If I have to suffer through it, so do you. Um, so John said a little, I, I, my name is Craig Trump, I'm Director of Economic Development at LSU uh, in the Office of Research and Economic Development. And um, uh, a lot of people will ask, um, I, John gave a biography, essentially what I really work on is, is connecting dots. And connecting and, and dots, dots mean both dots inside of the university um, and primarily outside. Because really what you have at a university is you have a, a vast array of subject matter experts in many cases who don't understand or appreciate or know how to translate that expertise first into capabilities and certain second how to connect that capability to someone who might need it who might need their help and in that in that dynamic I've been excited to work with a lot of faculties and start to uncover the things that they're working on and start to think about them in a different way which is to say those universities that have figured out this interaction between a, a Carnegie Mellon terrific example right sort of cornered the market on an autonomous vehicle because they got way ahead of big data and robotics and, uh, and the AI and the sensor control and the behavioral analysis and all of those various disciplines that you really need to pull something like that off. I'm excited to be part of these smart city conversations from a university perspective because I truly believe the university has a tremendous amount of resources and assets that perhaps heretofore haven't been applied in the right way. So I spent a lot of time thinking about that, not only across disciplines, but for this effort. Uh, for, for this morning, one of the things I really wanted to do um, is, is talk about how I perceive um, smart city and, and technology. Uh, and, and John stole a little bit of my thunder earlier, which is quite all right. Uh, he's got the height. Um, uh, to talk about, um, it, it's more of a thought process for me. So it's been a privilege for me to serve on the smart city committee with, um, with the mayor's office and work with some of their data. And, and one of the things that struck me, um, being, I, I suppose, now inside of the walls of higher ed, is that Smart City is, is a brand, right? I mean, in essence, there are companies who, who brand it in Smart City, and, and as John alluded to, there, there are myriad definitions for what it means. And one of the things that I started thinking about was, okay, how do, you, how do you become a Smart City? Because I'm really interested not necessarily in planting that flag, but in earning that flag. And earning that flag means, what steps and what things am I doing to make that the case? So, ever the contrarian, I asked, how do you become a smart city? And if you aren't a smart city, are you that? Like, that's not a very good brand. But it's an interesting way to think about it because smart city is sort of aspirational. A dumb city forces you to say, well, am I a dumb city? And of course, reflexively, most people would say, well, no, I'm not a dumb city. But from the perspective of what do I not know? What are, my, what are my known unknowns? Where's my data? You may very well say, I might be a dumb city. And I, don't, I think that's perfectly fine. I think that's okay. I think that's, that's a reckoning. That's an awareness that says, I need to understand what it is that I don't know. And I, I got excited about this dumb city, not because I can market this. This is terrible. But, but dumb city, the, the process of becoming a smart city means to me that. It's becoming a less dumb city, which is to say, if every single day I am taking the steps to say, what do I know? What do I not know? How am I making sure? And how am I making sure that, I, that, that I'm doing this? And again, smart city is very aspirational, whereas something like less dumb city forces you to deal every single day with what you know and what you don't know and the challenges. And to understand that if I have disparate stakeholders who might be aligned politically differently, might have siloed data, that I, I have to work with that. I have to, first of all, appreciate the landscape, appreciate the data they have, and then figure out how to motivate them so that I can advance. Okay? So the less dumb city um, concept for me was I, I, I've hit on something. I have no idea what other than, you know, this. It looks good on a slide. 
Uh, but so when you think about that process of, okay, how do I become a less dumb city? Again, something far less sexier, but far more focused is this. That is really what I think we're talking about, is a deliberate city. Is a city who's saying, a deliberate city, for me, embraces the fact that technology is not a solution. Technology is an enabler to a solution, right? If, if anyone has ever suffered through the bad deployment of a software package, you recognize that it can introduce pain that never existed, okay? And so simply installing technology or moving towards these things or plugging this thing in and turning that widget and using that app doesn't make you a smart city if it doesn't solve the problems. And so this forces you to say, what is at the core of my problem? What is the real, the key driver? And what technology is available to me to accelerate or enable that? Okay? Uh, and, and I use this example in sort of, I, I like to refer to technology a lot as, as, um, as magic. And it's true, you open, up, you open up Waze, you open up Uber, and it's, it's magic. And there, there's a great quote from Arthur Clarke about that. But the, the, the point is here is that if I had told you simply years ago that Google would ask you to tell them exactly where you are and how fast you're going at all times, you'd have said no. And yet that's exactly what you do, because it's, it's magic. And they didn't figure out mapping technology, they didn't figure out directions, they figured out math and they figured out UI and UX, well Waze did, and then Google bought them. But my point is, it was a very deliberate approach to taking resources and research and really fundamental problem-solving ability and putting it onto understanding exactly what was going to have, what, what challenges people were having, and then sticking that in a package that made everybody use it. So the deliberate city, at least in Baton Rouge, where I get excited about is it's a university city. It's a college town. And when you look at, I, I think, at the forefront of the next cities that are going to start turning this, turning this, uh, turning this corner, um, a Carnegie Mellon, again, is a great example of what did they tap into? They tapped into subject matter expertise that, frankly, in some cases, had never been asked. I'm talking about mathematicians, people who study behavioral analy analysis. There's no way traffic is simply a civil engineering problem. It's a behavioral issue, it's a flow issue, it's a timing issue, it's a composition issue. And so being able to appreciate that and f tap into those subject matter experts who can help you think through those dynamics is, is important. So I'll say that, and that's, that's what I hope to do, at least in the, the context of the smart city for the university, is LSU has all these things. It has the research, it has re modeling and computational, it has expertise in all these things, and it has a structure. And structure meaning that we can engage with the city and we can engage with industry stakeholders to, to help solve some of these problems. So if, if, if you were deliberate and you started using and leveraging all these assets or leveraging this expertise if you had it available, that starts to get, for me, where, where again, perhaps more intriguing than a smart city is a clever city. Because a clever city says, not only do I have the expertise and the assets and the resources, but I understand the, the things I can control and the things I can't. Being in Baton Rouge, I can't control the river and I can't control the bridge, but I can use it to my opportunity depending on what it is I'm trying to achieve based on objectives. And that's why I'm excited that this is a planning session because if you can use all of these tools in your planning, then there are, there are certain cities, Seattle's a terrific example, who leverages its own geographic borders and boundaries, what some people would consider re con restrictions or constrictions, and flips them, flips them into advantages to try and achieve certain objectives within the city. So, clever city for me, again, I'm not gonna own this brand, uh, but I do, like the, I do like the way that it forces us forces us to think about how it is that we're, that we're governing, how we're using data, and how we're leveraging technology. And if you do all that, you, you become an innovative city. Because innovation is incremental, innovation is painful, innovation requires a lot of smashing things together. And if you, even if you started sniffing at something that looked like clever or innovative, nobody would ever say you weren't smart. So, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Greg. And our uh, last speaker for this panel um, is Justin Aaronworth, President and CEO of the Water Institute of the Gulf. Justin took the helm as President and CEO of the Water Institute of the Gulf in early 2017. Justin previously served as the inaugural Executive Director of the Gulf Coast Ecosystem Restoration Council, created in the aftermath of the BP Deepwater Horizon oil spill, and was tasked with re restoring the ecosystem and revitalizing the economy of the Gulf Coast. Prior to joining the council, Justin served as chief of staff to the U.S. Dep Deputy Secretary of Commerce and assistant counsel to the president. Justin is a summa cum laude graduate of Colby College 
and holds a master's in philosophy, politics, and economics from the University of Oxford and a JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Please join me in welcoming Justin Aaron Worth. Good morning. Thank you very much for, uh, for, for being here, and uh, I want to compliment uh, CPEX for pulling this uh, group of, of thinkers and people together. Uh, is, is Boo in the audience? Is Boo? Oh, thank you very much, Boo, for your leadership uh, and for CPEX leadership in this community and, and beyond. We're, we're very fortunate. This is a conference that uh, so many of us uh, look forward to. It's, it's rare to bring this many different aspects of our collective work together. So thank you so much for, for your leadership and, and your organization's leadership. Um, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about uh, a few of the things that the, the Water Institute is, uh, is, is doing. And we are a, uh, uh, I'll leave this up here to tell the story briefly uh, without going through the slides, all of the slides in great detail because this is the first panel and you shouldn't be killed with PowerPoint quite yet. So let me just give you a quick little bit of context of, of, of who we are. Uh, we're just a few blocks uh, down the street. And we were created uh, because some folks after Katrina decided that the way to figure out how to manage water uh, was to first go take the pilgrimage, go over to the Netherlands, figure out how the Dutch do it. Uh, because the Dutch, of course, have been protecting their coastline for the last 800 years. And their horrific moment that, that lives on in everybody's uh, uh, psyche was the, the Great Flood of 1953 in the Netherlands. So in any case, after Katrina, uh, then Senator Landrieu, the Baton Rouge Area Foundation, a bunch of leaders from this state started making trips over there. And they saw many things. One of the things that really impressed them was the applied uh, research that was taking place in the Netherlands around coastal and deltaic uh, challenges. So they saw a group called Deltaris, which really is the premier coastal and deltaic group uh, in the world. And were very impressed by everything they saw. And they came back to Louisiana and they said, and that Deltaris was impressive. We need to get us one of them, get us one of them here. And so they uh, recruited uh, my predecessor at the Water Institute, an internationally renowned hydrologist named Chip Grote, who had led the US Geological Survey under Presidents Clinton and, and Bush. Uh, and, and Chip became the president. He recruited some of the best minds uh, in the world uh, to come, uh, come here and leave tenured positions and, and to really think through how we can best uh, protect uh, our, our coast, but also recognizing that water respects no borders. And so we were not named the Coastal and Protection Institute. We were not named the Coastal Institute. We were named the Water Institute. Uh, and I think that's very apt. And I'll, I'll, I'll say a little bit more about it as I go through a few slides, because I was uh, uh, really wanted to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we face in this state that are not unique to this state around flooding and uh, the, the stressors you face being a coastal state, but also being a, uh, a state with so many watersheds uh, that are susceptible to, to flooding. So uh, I really want to uh, compliment uh, this uh, parish, East Baton Rouge Parish, uh, for their, uh, uh, the, the foresight, I think, that has gone into this set of issues. Of course, there was uh, some terrible flooding that we suffered uh, in this area and in other parts of the state last year. And I put this slide up just to show that there's important work that we need to do. Uh, this is a map of, of some of the flood models that exist. And as you can see, without going into all the detail, some of the models that we have here date back to the 70s and the 80s. And of course, there's been a lot of development, and as things develop, you need to keep those models updated. If not, you have a, you have a lack of information. And I'll come back to that. I'm not gonna go through all the details of the, of the uh, floods of last year, but for those of you who who uh, uh, lived through it in one way or the other, you know the devastation. And we continue to try to uh, recover and we have much more uh, uh, work that was work underway and much more work uh, to do. Uh, this is a, a, a photo of uh, North Louisiana. And I included it to really make the point that you know, sometimes uh, there's, a, there's a divide in our state. There's the, 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 the view from South Louisiana, the view of North Louisiana. The point of this slide is to say that we all suffer from these challenges. This is about 21 inches of of rain uh, in North Louisiana. Uh, we're all in this, uh, in this boat together. So one of the things, uh, and, and we thought it made a lot of sense to talk about it under this banner of smart technology and how technology can help us make better decisions and, and be better leaders. Uh, we have the, the, the technology exists today where we can have early warning flood systems of a, of a remarkable uh, degree of resolution. And I'm gonna get into a little bit of the detail around it, but it'll, it, when, you, when you see the demonstration, you can understand how it would help first responders be, in better, uh, uh, be better positioned 
to respond in a, in a disaster and also help citizens make better decisions. Our approach is, is fairly simple and, and, and I, I won't, I'll, I'll use this slide to actually convey it because it's really a three-step process to get to the outcome uh, that technology will, uh, will, will, will provides for us. The first step we've got, which is uh, important data that the federal government provides, the National Weather Service, the U.S. Geological Survey, uh, we, we, we of course have that, uh, have that information and it is of a, of, a, of a very high quality. So that's very good. We've got that, but in the floods of, uh, uh, of last year, when you could see from the, the, the stream gauges that, the, that, that, that streams were, were, were flooding, that's not going to help you necessarily understand what street is going to flood, what subdivision is going to flood. So important information, but doesn't tell the full story. The second piece is that we need to have updated inland flood models and coastal flood models. And the good news for us in Louisiana, for example, is that uh, on the coastal side of things, we have invested, uh, because our, our leaders have been quite visionary in this, we've invested a lot of money and a lot of resources uh, modeling the entire coastal system. Uh, we have a 50-year, 50, $50 billion dollar coastal master plan, which is really the envy, I think, of, uh, of, of the country. Uh, so good news on that sense, Inland flooding, as uh, the EBR slide uh, showed earlier, we have some work that we need to do, and it's not just in East Baton Rouge, it's, it's, it's around the state. If we have those first two pieces, then we can have some pretty remarkable uh, output that will allow us to make better, better decisions in the short, medium, and long term. And I'll give a, a little example of it. Uh, this is just a, a, a quick a synopsis of how this modeling uh, works. I, I, I tend to think in pictures, so if you look at the middle of the slide, that's, that's this moment. Uh, look to the, to the left, you've got history. You've got uh, what the, the, the coastal, uh, coastal model actually showed, and those little dots, uh, the ideal is that those dots line up with, with the model. And basically what this shows is that we're constantly improving our models. So we have a hypothesis, we have a theory, and then as events take place, we're able to recalibrate the model so that the forecast period looking out uh, is, is improved. Uh, the same concept exists, what I just showed you was coastal, the same concept exists in the inland environment. And, uh, uh, and, and, and I put this slide up because we really have a remarkable opportunity in, in this state and we have the opportunity to export what we are doing in this state uh, around the country and indeed around the world. Uh, right now, in part because of uh, the, the terrible floods of last year, there's a lot of focus, appropriately so, on improving our modeling and improving our capabilities to predict and respond to, to flooding events. What would be uh, a, a real danger, uh, we think, is if it turned out that we had a bunch of different models that didn't talk to each other, that were not consistent. As I mentioned, we already have modeling for the entire coast, which is to our great advantage. But if there are pockets of excellence, if you will, great work that is done in the inland watersheds around uh, this state, but they don't all talk to each other, they don't talk to one another, they don't talk to the coastal uh, models, well then water, of course, will laugh at us, right? It will say, well, uh, I, I'm not gonna be in apple form over here and in pineapple form over here and orange form over here so you can pull it all together. We have to pull all of these models together, uh, ensure consistency, and the good news is that, uh, that we can. We can do that. Uh, and if we do, put this all together, there again you see the, on the coastal side and on the, on the inland uh, side, we have something that's, that's fairly remarkable. And we at the Water Institute do a lot of work with our colleagues in the, in the Netherlands. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, a small city uh, in the Netherlands that was, uh, that was modeled. Imagine that one, three, five, seven days in advance of a, of a, a significant rain event, we can do this. If we have the up-to-date inland models in this state, we can do this. This is called real-time forecasting, and it allows us to, uh, it's just like the weather, in the sense of the closer you get to the event, the more accurate this, uh, this, this simulation would be. And one of the challenges that we faced in the state last year in the floods is that there were areas that flooded significantly that historically never did, or never, certainly never flooded to that uh, extreme degree that they did. If we were able to have something like this, where we could better predict and say, this area we're flying over right now, good news, looks like that roadway, this infrastructure is going to be passable. However, on both sides, we're going to have some serious uh, problems. That will allow, again, first responders to better position assets to, to respond in advance. It will allow citizens to move their, themselves and their assets uh, out, of, uh, out of harm's way. 
And what I find most exciting about this is that the technology exists. It's there. We don't have to do a quantum leap. It's called Delft Fuse. It's already been developed. You have to have those three pieces I mentioned, the federal government information, which we've got, the up-to-date models, and then we can add, add this piece on top of it. So uh, to us, it's a, it's a remarkably exciting opportunity to use technology to better inform our planning, to make our communities more resilient, and to allow uh, first responders and citizens to better prepare and better respond to events that we know will, will happen in the future. It's not a question of if there will be another uh, a, a difficult uh, a weather event or rain event. There will be. The question is when and, and, and it, what can we do to be best, best prepared for it. So I do uh, appreciate the opportunity to share a few of these uh, thoughts with you, and uh, uh, we're really closed by thanking, uh, again, CPEX and everybody here for focusing on the, the, the manner in which science and technology can, can help us. Um, the, the, the previous speaker rightly spoke of, of some of the things that are happening in, in, in Pittsburgh with Carnegie Mellon and the University of Pittsburgh. And uh, actually, I grew up there, and, and I, I grew up there in the shadow of the steel mill industry uh, closing. And you go to Pittsburgh now, I don't even recognize the place I, I, I grew up in because of the tech transfer and the, the work that was done by Carnegie Mellon and the other universities in that area. It's completely transformed that area. There's no reason that water in the water sector, uh, it's, it's transforming our community right now, but can't continue to do that in a remarkable way. So I, I thank everybody here and, uh, uh, and we'll look forward to uh, working with you to make that so. Thank you. Thank you, Justin, and uh, please join me again in a round of applause for Justin, Joel, and Greg. I'd like to ask uh, Justin, Joel, and Greg if y'all could come out. Um, we're going to do uh, some, some Q&A. Uh, we've got some time for uh, Q&A from the audience. Um, Justin, Joel, and Greg will uh, sit right over here. So if you've heard something that uh, piqued your interest in one of their presentations or one of the topics that may be applicable to um, multiple or all three of our panelists, uh, please feel free to, uh, to ask away. I think they're being shy backstage. Let them come on back. So we've got someone walking around with a mic. If anyone has a question, um, I'll kind of key things off here. Um, and this is kind of for each of the panelists. As we were sitting watching all of your presentations, I'm curious in y'all's opinion, what's the single biggest potential obstacle or challenge or impediment associated with the, the value proposition that you talked about, whether it's with real-time flood forecasting or effective university partnerships or you know, broad adoption of uh, your platform, Joel. Justin, if you want to start things off. Sure. Can you hear me? So the biggest challenge. Um, as I said, uh, the good news for thinking about real-time forecasting and being better prepared for, for the next flood, the good news is we have the technology. I think the biggest challenge is in the realm of governance. So uh, to, to just take our, our, our situation in, in Louisiana, we have a number of state agencies who have jurisdiction over this set of issues. We have the Coastal Protection, uh, CPRA, we have the Department of Transportation, we have GOSEP, we have the Office of Community Development, and that's good in the sense that we have a number of state agencies that are all focused on this set of issues. The challenge, of course, is that we need to ensure that all of the agencies are on the same page and that we can actually have a consistent, a consistent vision. Uh, I think the same thing is true um, when, you, when you consider parish lines. So at the moment, there's a lot of work uh, going on right now in, for example, Calcasieu Parish, which is great. There's, a, there's an initiative to model 10 of the watersheds and bring it up to, uh, to the, to the uh, specs that I was describing. Uh, there's a similar situation in, uh, in, in New Orleans. There's, there's some work being done in eight parishes in Acadiana, which is all very encouraging. The question, however, I think is, uh, are we able to, to bring it all together? Because, again, and I hate to repeat it, but the water doesn't respect any of these jurisdictional boundaries, whether they're state agencies or, or parish lines. So our hope 
is that there can be uh, a coordinated vision. And I think uh, conferences like this and, and, and uh, uh, discussions where we're able to bring all these ideas together uh, give us the best uh, possible path forward. Sorry. Um, so I'll, I'll say, I'll echo that a little bit and I'll just reframe governance as leadership, it's people. And, and when I say leadership, I don't mean leadership as you need some sweeping aspiration or someone setting the tone, although that's important. I mean, I'm at a place at a university where collaboration, the word collaboration gets used like other people use commas. Right? I mean, they, they, they talk it, but they don't mean it in, in a lot of cases because collaboration requires individual leadership. It requires, it requires someone to say, all right, I need you, you need me, we're gonna work together to, to focus on the challenge as opposed to to focus on whatever my internal domain is. And, and it, that's reflected in a little bit about what Justin said. So leadership, and that's really the culture change. The culture change has to be that, that th th this notion of shared prosperity and that the turf wars, um, that if someone has to bear political capital for making decisions of winners and losers, that some of that political capital can be shared because, it's going, because the prosperity is gonna be shared. And so that's when I, when I think about the biggest obstacle to alignment, it's leadership, but it's, it's, it's individual leadership. It's getting those people who have always been, no, 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 mine, 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 to say, you know, you have expertise that I need to use, there are win-wins, and that just, takes, that just takes, it takes careful personal engagement and time. When I was working with the city of Boston, I heard this interesting uh, stat that at the time, this was 2011, that they had more employees than Google, which you know was was not an intuitive thing, even though obviously it's a big you know organization. And I think that kind of that speaks to this issue. Um, you know, process change is very hard, and process change is harder in organizations that are 200 years old. And we see that every day. I mean, we're trying to bring innovation in our kind of, you know, in our specific version of innovation to, to cities. And uh, it's the little things, right? Like at being attached to the specific formatting of a carbon copy form, right? That because they've used it for 30 years. And I don't really know, you know, that's, I think that's one of the obstacles. I don't really know if there's a silver bullet to uh, overcoming that, I mean, I think you both touched on it. It's it's probably ultimately just a willingness to, you know, let change happen, and you know, often that requires leadership. Um, and uh, but it, it, it's very difficult, and and uh, you know, it's I think that if it's not broken, don't fix it. Paradigm is is a hard one to overcome. So. Good. Thanks, you guys. Any other questions from the audience? This message is for Joel. Um, I've got. Uh, this is for Joel. Um, what's been your biggest um, hiccup trying to get cities to implement your plan or to come on board with what you're trying to achieve? Yep. Thanks. Um, you know, one concept that that I talk a, a lot about is the idea that you know we call it the zoning code and the municipal code. These are code bases, right? These are it's like a software code base, but it's just written in a word document. And so part of our pitch is like we're we're just translating the laws into a format that's executable and queryable. And in other words, we're not changing anything. So we're, you know to the obstacle that I just kind of was talking about, like we're actually, we're a very light touch on any kind of process change. We're really not asking for new policies or we're just building a different user interface to the existing process and policy. And I think that that's a, a very helpful way to, for us, you know, kind of as a company, but also I, I think for change in general is if you can if you can make a change happen with a minimal amount of disruption, uh, you know that's that's often a very successful approach. Yeah, are they receptive to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it varies, right? And um, but when we can come in and, and really say, look, we're we're just we're codifying your existing process. We're not we're not asking you to do anything differently. But and and what's amazing to me is sometimes it's the first time that a city will have seen their zoning code fully specified. 
you know, like the city of Boston, I think it was 36,000 unique permutations of, you know, restaurant in all the different districts and yoga studio. So we, you know, computers are great at this, right? And I, I don't know if it's even, you know, I think some of the people we work with have tremendous institutional knowledge and, you know, they're amazing in helping us get our program set up, but computers are very good at this, you know, indexing and searching, that's kind of, that's what they do. So, yeah, great question. I mean, it's, it's, it's something we think about a lot and I think it's a common theme here of, you know, if we're doing this kind of upgrade and innovation to, to help cities be smarter, you know, how do, what are the mechanics of actually getting there? Yes, ma'am, right back there. I'm just a concerned citizen uh, from the city of Baton Rouge and, of course, you're aware of the flooding that went on here last August. Um, this is for Justin. Um, this program that you have, first question is, will it, is this similar to what they have in Mud Island in Memphis, and will it be open to the public to review and see? And then the second question is, I love your simulation up there and the view. So will we see you on Channel 9 <laughs> with that <laughs> giving us this flood report so that we will be aware in the community? How will that happen? Well, thank you for the question. Um, first, the good news, no, you won't see me on Channel 9. You'll see much better people. Um, but in all seriousness, um, so the, the technology that I demonstrate, uh, demonstrated, again, as I said, that exists. Uh, so the question is, uh, will we implement it? And that's, you know, we're the, so we're the Water Institute. We are a nonprofit applied research group. Our job is to say, we can do this stuff. And here are the challenges that we see out there, and here are some of the solutions. What we can't do is mandate it and, and make it so. Um, we, we certainly believe in the technology. I, I really like the way that, 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 that I think all, all of us are, what we're all saying is that the technology can't fix the underlying um, uh, problem necessarily. What technology can do is, is help to uh, amplify potential solutions, but that ultimately, and I think this was a common uh, thread through all of our comments, um, we need the people um, and leaders. I thought that was better than governance. Leadership to, to say, all right, that technology exists, we're going to implement it. And then uh, our technology is such that we could, make, we could put, implement everything that I showed and then make it available to parish officials. Parish officials could retain the discretion to run those models themselves. They could make it available open source to anybody. So it, the technology definitely is such that you could log on and you could type in your address and you could say one, five, seven days out, it's supposed to rain heavy, is my street going to flood? The technology can answer that question for you. The people need to decide, A, are we going to do it? B, are we going to link it to all the other models that exist around the state? Because what I can tell you also, there are limitations to the technology. If we were to, say, get all the right models in EBR, but, not, but ignore the surrounding parishes and ignore the impact on the coastal side, the model is not going to be, the model can't fix that. The model can't transcend these, these, these parish boundaries. So at the end of the day, the answer to your question, the good news is, no, I won't be on TV. However, um, this technology can be made available to the good people who will be on TV. And I think, personally, I think it would be very powerful if, uh, if, if this ends up getting implemented and then you see something on the local news that says, this is a simulation. We can't say with absolute certainty, no model is perfect, but we predict that these areas over here are going to flood. If you live in those areas, you would be well advised to make preparation. To me, that just sounds like a very good use of technology and, and you know, we're just, we're, we're just waving the flag saying if leadership and others think that there's a, a need for that and that it will help, we've got the technology to make it so. Great, thank you. Right over there. Yeah, this is a related question for Mr. Aaronworth. Um, do you have any idea of what it would cost to implement uh, that technology for uh, East Baton Rouge Parish? And if it were mandated, how long would it take to do so? Um, so we, we did some sort of back of the envelope thinking about what this would take for, uh, to implement something like this for the entire state. We haven't done any kind of you know, formal budgeting. A lot of it is, is, is really contingent on the biggest piece of this in terms of cost and time 
are the inland flood models. That's the biggest part. The, the, the USGS data already exists, is free to us. Same with National Weather Service, so that was part one. The technology called, again, Delphuse, that already exists, and we've got all that. So it's really that middle piece is the most expensive. Um, we, and I, you know, it's always, you know, dangerous to throw out numbers, but I, I, I'll, I'll throw out one, and this is not a, a formal one, but we believe the entire state could probably get up to where it would need to be for, for probably less than $20 million, which is a lot of money, but not a lot when you compare it to some of the other things. And I would argue, given the uh, potential benefits of something like this, that could be a worthy investment. But again, we don't, we don't advocate for policy, we just try to say what's, uh, what's available. So if, if there was that approximate sum of money, the, the, the entire state, you could do something like this in a period of less than three years. Uh, and you could do particular parishes or particular areas much more quickly than that. So again, we've been thinking at what would it take to do the entire state of, of Louisiana, so I can't, I, I, I'd be um, hard pressed to give more specific numbers uh, uh, or estimates for, for EBR. Good question, other one? One um, comment and then one question. The first is a comment question. Um, do you think that the technology has caught up to common sense? And the reason I say that is anyone who's lived in Baton Rouge, East Baton Rouge Parish, knows that Highland Road was named Highland Road because it's Highland and everything between that and the river is lowland. And uh, the common sense that was here before all the computers was you built down there at your own risk. Uh, today we have so many developments down there that I don't think the infrastructure has caught up to it. So that's question comment. And I'll say the second question, it's different, but you can deal with it. Collaboration, uh, we, I know each university has its own particular focus. Is collaboration being thought of between the four universities in this city? LSU, SU, um, BRCC, and FMOL University. So, sure. Greg, you want to try and take that? Yeah, sure. So, um, as a, well, speaking to the, the, the common sense, I'll tell you, I live in a development below Highland. Um, so Take that for what it's worth. But it, it, as with everything, um, it's a risk calculation, right? I mean, even when I get in my car to drive back to campus or back home in my low-lying area, it's a risk calculation. Everything I do, everything we do, um, John and I have talked about it before, even public transportation, right? It's a, it's a, it's a pain risk threshold that you have to measure whether or not you're going to do that. So as to where the, the technology has caught up to the common sense, I'll answer it in this way. I personally think... I'll tell you, autonomous vehicles, which are, I think one of the reasons autonomous vehicles personally will be slow on the uptake is because of that, is because as good as the technology can be, you cannot account for someone who's just a jerk, right, as good as the AI becomes. Uh, and so I, I think that in some disciplines, the technology will absolutely exceed and control common sense, but behavior will, will take precedent. In terms of collaboration, absolutely. I talk to Southern often, working on a couple of projects, one in particular, which we submitted recently um, with the Department of Education, and it was a close collaboration between us and Southern. It was specifically around, I, I, and I don't know how much at liberty I'm able to talk about the proposal, but let me put it this way. If you've ever heard of the, um, um, it was the Harlem Project, where the Harlem, in Harlem, you had, a, you had a, a, an economic developer and a community activist who essentially said, all right, I, I have this cycle of poverty and it's being, it, you know, the beast is being fed by these four sorts of factors. Rather than trying to pick each one apart, I'm gonna try and fix them all at the same time and see if I can get the neighborhood to flip over zone by zone. He was remarkably effective. Department of Education internalized that model and said, okay, communities who are struggling, try it out. So we, we, the mayor's office, Southern University, LSU, and, L and, and community college system all got together uh, with certain elements uh, on the workforce part and are trying to focus on the Scotland Villa Struma area to do the same thing because you need, you need a lot of research. So that's an, it's an illustration of, yes, collaboration. I'm interested in it. There's, 
here's, there's no shortage of problems, right? So there's no shortage of problems. And there's no shortage of smart people who are willing to work on the problems, which is why I spend at least internally a lot of time on campus trying to figure out why is the wall there? Why is the wall there? Why is the wall there? How do we break it down? How do we break it down? I'm, I'm open to collaboration of any way, shape, or form. I won't speak for the rest of LSU. I don't know, and I don't, I don't really care. If there's good work to be done and problems to be solved, I'm interested in going to solve. Greg, just a quick follow-up to that. Um, could you spend just a minute or two talking about, speaking of collaboration, uh, not just across universities and colleges, but with local government in particular, um, talking about the partnership and National Science Foundation grant that LSU and the mayor's office in City Parish recently entered into, speaking of problem identification and research. Yeah, sure. So um, one of the things that I, that I thought about as I, as I joined the Smart City Committee, and, and it's true, most of the what I'll call smart city um, or city or traffic, first, let's say smart city typically means technology as it relates to transportation logistics, right? I mean, we're talking about traffic. But at the core, cities do a lot more than traffic and logistics. They have to deal with blight, they have to deal with governance, they have to deal with permitting, they have to deal with all these things. And so smart for me, at least from a smart city, means how do you, how do you, is there a way to leverage various technologies to help them make decisions faster, smarter, better? And in that context, um, the National Science Foundation, with whom LSU has a lot of work, right? National Science Foundation is the primary federal agency that funds basic discovery research. They have, they have initiated a new program called Smart and Connected Cities. And what they're interested in is not necessarily the technology around, hey, how do I make my traffic run better? It really is around what are the technologies that allow cities to do just that, connect them in a way that, they, that enables and accelerates their decision making. So LSU submitted a proposal, and we worked very directly with the mayor's office to go capture. And we were amongst the first cities, I think there were only less than two dozen nationally. There were maybe 150 who submitted, and there were only a handful that got basically accepted into the program. LSU was among them. It's not a lot of money initially because it's a planning grant, but what the National Science Foundation recognized in Baton Rouge was not that we had traffic or had crime or had, you know, had all the right technology. It was that we had the right people at the table. We had the right people at the table and NSF said, I need you to start building models for governance around how to show other municipalities or localities what collaboration looks like and what you did to enable that. How do I get Department of Transportation to acknowledge that it has data that the Capital Regional Planning Commission can use, that the big data and computational experts at LSU can assist, and all of us together tackling challenges with quantifiable objectives. So that was, that was the grant, and that was, a, that was a clear collaboration of, there's not a lot of fanfare. I mean, we, we did sort of press release, but there's not a lot of fanfare because it's a lot of hard work, right? A lot of hard work cracking open those data silos and making sure everyone's good and we're still working through some things. Um, but my hope very soon is that we will have some smart people in mathematics and computational science at LSU who are working on problems related to traffic and they've never been asked, right? This is taking their expertise and bringing it to bear on a challenge for people who may not have known that they existed. Great, thank you. Back right there. Uh, yes, I, I'd like to hear your comments on what many people believe is the major problem in technology and transfer, which is the staggering amount of data that is actually being produced <clears throat> on almost every a conceivable subject. And uh, the difficulty for decision makers in trying to ascertain what data is really important to make what decisions. And I, I, I know just in my small little world, I am inundated by uh, data and uh, trend analysis and uh, uh, statistics and trying to understand what is the important data to gather to make a decision seems to me from a smart city point of view one of the major issues because technology will allow you to gather almost anything on almost any subject but maybe that is not all that helpful. Joe, you want to take a crack at that? I mean, I would say it starts with objectives and, you know, that you, to, to really understand what your goals are and then to really think about the data that's serving those goals. I mean, I do think it's, it's a, you know, in Silicon Valley, it's kind of a known problem of optimizing for, you know, local optima, that if you're, you know, you take the Google approach of just, you know, even with the web interface of, you know, trying new designs and measuring and seeing what works better 
you know, you may not have the big breakthrough from that kind of automated approach that, you know, Apple had when they, you know, imagined a, a new device like that. You can't, you can't always optimize to the iPhone, right? And I think that's always the hard part, and that's where we come in as, you know, thinkers and, and imaginers is to, to have broader vision and, and use data to, to serve that. Um, so that's kind of a generic answer. I mean, I don't know your use case, but I think it really does, you know, we need to measure against what we're trying to accomplish and, and let the data serve those goals. And, and I'll take a quick swing. Um, Justin used the word governance. There's a version of that as it relates to data, and it's federation, right? So when you talk about federating your data, you need to understand what you need, when you need it, where you need it. And, and as anybody, and John will know this, as anybody who has dealt with massive amounts of data or opening data, when the city, when the city says, I want to liberate my data, it takes 18 months because you don't even know where half of it is. Right? And so to echo, to echo Joel's point about knowing exactly what it is you, you want, it's not about looking at the data. It's starting with uh, knowing that I'm going to be I, trying to answer the core of what you're trying to do within your business context challenge and then setting up governance and federation to only get that data, to, to wall off a lot of that noise. And, and I'll just add a footnote to those two comments. Um, I mentioned in my uh, uh, presentation the importance of consistency. So. On the, in the water context, in the flood context, we can collect and maintain and store lots and lots and lots of data. Exactly to your point, I thought your question is spot on. If we're not doing it in a format that ultimately allows us to use it for something that is usable. I mean, again, you know, to just give a real life example, we had great storm gauges, uh, stream gauges for the floods of, of last year. They didn't fail, we got the data from them. What we didn't know was how to fill in the gap between the waters rising over here, what is that going to mean for the subdivision over here? So in, in, in our minds, it's really about what's the end, and it's, it's been said, so I'll just repeat it. Um, what's the end goal? What is the, um, the, what is the, what is the tool that we are looking to create? That's where we begin. And then, to your point, there's reams and reams of data. Uh, and what we're most concerned about in the, in the flood context and being able to get to some of these uh, technological outcomes is the governance stuff that's, that's, that we've all uh, discussed, but also consistency. And not just collecting data for the sake of it, but being very thoughtful on the front end before you, because you can invest many, many millions of dollars in data collection, but if it's not being done in a consistent fashion, at the end of the day, you just got lots and lots of files and lots and lots of data that's not necessarily usable for uh, implementable solutions? I think it's an excellent question. That was a great question. We've got time for, I think, two more. Hi, my name is Sarah White. I'm from the city of New Orleans. Um, I have a question with respect to the vehicles with which we can engage with the technology companies or providers. You know, there are a lot of solutions out there, um, many of which that we would love to be able to leverage for a variety of reasons. And you know we're pitched different things all the time, but the problem is that there's not necessarily a way that we can engage with these solutions. So, you know, it's important to talk about the obstacles from the perspective of the city because there are a lot of reasons that we can't leverage these tools, um, not for want of wanting to use them or to innovate. But so, what? How might we be able to engage with these types of solutions or these vendors or these collab? You know, how do we leverage this collaboration? How do we plug into that kind of stuff when we are, you know, so our hands are tied behind our backs for so many reasons? Um, well, I, as somebody, I, I'll take a, I'll take kind of a swing. I mean, I don't, I don't work for the city, um, but I have met with a lot of people who work for the city uh, in the smart city committee meeting, and one of the things we talk about. Um, and, and the words come up a lot here, is objectives, which is what is it that you're trying to do? And, and that's why planning matters so much. Because if your objective, let's say I was gonna take the bridge in Baton Rouge, if my objective is to fix the bridge, I, got, I have a thousand options at my disposal. And so if one of them is, okay, if, one of the, if, if I identify that one of the challenges on the bridge is, well, there's, it's the composition. It's the, inter, you know, it's the mixing of, of modalities. So there's freight and there's commuter traffic, and I need to break that up. So I think I need to move more freight through the system. Okay? That is a specific objective that could require a very specific technology, but you're gonna need consensus on the objective. 
And that's where you need a smart city committee. Sorry, my voice is, is, is fading. But I, I think it's that. I think it's that it's to understand, and, and Joel alluded to this earlier, is that no technology is going to, no matter how well it's sold, no offense, no technology is going to solve all your issues unless you identify, and with some consensus and some leadership, what it is that you want to do. Because then you'll be able to back out and say, does that technology satisfy what I'm trying to do? And in terms of traffic, and we spend a lot of time thinking about this, is it's not just somebody sitting there, click, 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 counting. It's, do I want more people in that direction? Do I want less people in this direction? Do I fix that intersection by either increasing flow or reducing the amount of people that go to the intersection? All of those have profound implications, some of which are political and economic, about the way that you think about that. So I would, I would encourage you, at least, to find the stakeholders in the city who are, are thinking along those lines and, and, and recognizing what you want to do, from an, probably from an economic development perspective, where you want the city to head and what you're trying to achieve, and then look for technology that can satisfy that. Can I just, yeah. um, Sarah, I think you may have lost your mic there, but w when you say your hands are tied, I mean, is this like a finding the, the solutions? Like, what, what, where in the process is, is the problem? Procurement. Procurement, oh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, there's no solution. <laughs> Sarah, I hope you stick around for our next panel because we've got someone who may have a solution for you. I do want to add to, to, to that. I know you mentioned procurement, um, and you know, Greg mentioned starting with you know, what are the objectives you're trying to solve, and I think two important variables in that are the policy and infrastructure investments that you're making. And you know, we do a fair amount of work in the Las Vegas area, and they've really invested in their strip and surrounding area and the connectivity of the strip. Um, primarily to enable autonomous vehicles to support their tourism and hospitality sectors um, while simultaneously building a policy environment within city limits that can help cultivate and accommodate the new technologies as they're coming about, not presuming to define the technologies, but ensuring that they've got both the public policy in place as well as the supporting infrastructure for that technology to map back to that based on what the objectives may be. We have time for one final question. Way up there. We have time for. I think it's an excellent question, and I think the answer is yes. Um, and what we what we like to do, and even with, with what I uh, described in terms of this real-time forecasting, we like doing a pilot first. Try something small. Pick a particular area that is representative uh, and give it a try. Uh, and if for some reason it's not uh, performing appropriately, you have a test case. If you start and your objective is to take care of the entire thing all at once and you fail, the risk of that failure is much, is much greater. If you have a pilot and you, we like talking about adaptive management. So with all of our work, we put in an adaptive management plan. So failure is not, I, you know, the ideal is that you don't see failure, you see, oh, this is not performing in the way that we uh, expected, let's figure out how to tweak that and tweak this piece, get it right in a smaller location and then be in a position to, to expand. Doesn't mean that if you nail it in a pilot situation, it's easy and you can perfectly um, uh, implement in a larger environment, but it gives you a much, a much better start. So we found, to exactly your point, that uh, beginning with a pilot helps, doesn't perfectly transcend the challenges that I think you rightly addressed, but it gives you a, a, a better fighting chance to, to, to get to the macro level outcome that you desire. And I'll just chime in very quickly. Um, so one of the things that we're, we're working on <clears throat> at the university is um, not all problems are equal. And so you need to triage. Triage, what, what am I trying to solve that's gonna have the biggest impact and map out process? And I mean to, to the detail. Because sometimes it's a process that's a problem and sometimes it's a person that's a problem in that process. 
And if it's a person, you can address it. If it's a process, then you can dig deeper. But the way that you figure that out or, or you go through that exercise in the first place is triage, is understanding, again, what is it going to have the most impact? Because in, in, in one of the things that, that becomes clear within organizations is you have, again, thousands of processes. There might be a few core ones. To, to And Joel and I were talking about this backstage, is that there may be one thing in there that's causing all sorts of hidden emanations, and you can't see it because you haven't mapped it yet. And just. John, one yep. just quick comment. I mean, I think I think this does go to the procurement question. You know, a lot of cities are experimenting with, you know, innovation procurement standards so that it is possible to work with you know technology vendors for for small dollar amounts and do a pilot and just try where you know the risk of failure is not very high. And it, I think that's a terrific trend for for everyone, really, right? Like for for the vendor community to be to keep innovating and have opportunities to work with cities and learn and improve the products, and also for cities to just try and, and not have such high stakes that, you know, it's not a uh, you know, $50 million website project that, it, you know, if it doesn't work or it's over time or budget, it's, you know, a huge problem. So I think that's a terrific trend, and, and there, Philadelphia, I think, is doing some good work there, and a number of cities are working on that. These have all been great questions and, and great presentations and responses from the panelists. Please join me in thanking these guys again for their time. Thank y'all. Before you take your break, I wanted to recognize some elected officials. I think every one of you in this room is important and that you're here is going to effectively change some policies. But the elected officials are the ones that then have to make those decisions. So I want to thank um, Mayor Joel Robito from Lafayette. I think uh, Parish President Timmy Roussel is here again, and Donna Collins Lewis, Barbara Freiberg, and Matt Watson from the East Baton Rouge Parish Council. So thank y'all for coming and thank all of you. We have some CPEX board members here too, so I want to thank them for coming. So thank all of you and enjoy your break. <laughs>